Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, EdTech Leadership Evolves in Houston. My name is Michelle Davis, and I'm a senior writer for Education Week Digital Directions. Today's webinar has been sponsored by It's Learning. School districts are making the big push into educational technology and the possibility it provides for engaging students in new ways, teaching them to use 21st century skills, and raising student achievement. Every day we're reading about districts ad adopting one-to-one -one device initiatives or testing out innovative blended learning projects in their schools. We're reading about model districts like North Carolina's Mooresville Graded School District, which has boosted student achievement using, in part, an emphasis on technology and a one-to-one -one device program. But we're also reading about districts where technology innovation hasn't gone so well, like the Los Angeles Unified School District, where a controversial one-to-one -one iPad program is, is falling apart amid allegations of overspending and subpar digital curricula, among other issues. The difference between success and failure in some of these ed tech initiatives can be the quality of leadership and how school and district leaders do everything from approach and educate various stakeholders to how they limit or expand the scope of a project. Our two guests today have a working relationship that balances an aggressive vision for digital innovation with a realistic sense of what schools can do with the resources they have. They'll talk about how their district's EdTech ed plan has evolved over time, how they weigh innovation and practicality, and how they've used their differing styles to accomplish these goals. We'll hear from Terry Greer, the superintendent of the Houston Independent School District in Texas, and Lenny Shad, the chief technology information officer also in the Houston Independent School District. Uh, the accomplishments of both our guests were highlighted recently in our Leaders to Learn From special report which you can read at edweek.org backslash leaders. Before we begin, uh, now's a good time to review some of the technical aspects of today's presentation. Please check the audio setting on your computer as well as your speaker volume settings if you're having any audio trouble. If you're still having issues, please see our detailed audio troubleshooting file, which is available in the handouts folder at the bottom of the console. There are also some other icons that open some additional feature panels in our webinar console. You can read about today's speakers in the bio panel, click the handouts panel to download a copy of today's slides, and follow the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter using the hashtag EWWebinar. You can also follow me on Twitter at EWMDavis. Don't forget to submit your questions anytime during this webinar by typing into the Ask a Question box on your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can, so start asking now. Finally, an on-demand archive of today's presentation will be available online in the next 24 hours. Both the archive and a free-to-download version of the PowerPoint slides will be accessible, accessible through edweek.org. Now I want to hand the presentation over to Terry and Lenny um, and hear from them on this topic. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to be with you this morning, and Lenny and I both are honored to, to be part of the webinar. Yes, good afternoon. Um, it's, 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 I'm looking forward to spending a few minutes talking to you about what, uh, what HISD is doing, uh, Dr. Greer's vision, and how we're executing on that vision. I want to start out a little bit by just telling you about HISD. We are the seventh largest school district in the country, the largest district in Texas. Uh, we have 283 schools that serve a little over 215,000 students. Uh, our kids uh, speak more than 90 languages as their first language. Uh, we are about 82% uh, economically disadvantaged and about 92% non-white. Our largest subpop is our Latino population, which is about 64% followed by an African-American population of about 28%. Our white students make up about 8% of our population. Our Asian students, about 6%. And then, of course, we have a, a group that is, is called Other. Uh, we're a big school district. We are, run over 330 square miles in the most diverse city in America. So we have our challenges, like uh, most other large uh, urban districts. And we really do believe that technology uh, has the potential to give our kids a leg up on other students from around the country. And we're in our 
second year of a one-to-one -one digital conversion, giving all of our high school students a laptop to use at school and to take home. Uh, we started with 11 schools in year one. Uh, we're doing 18 schools this year, and we're going to do 16 schools next year. The, the program that Dr. Greer just talked about, uh, we, we call Power Up. Um, and it, it is giving our high school students a device to take home. Um, it's a three-year initiative, but I think the key that really has differentiated us um, from other systems that have, have attempted to do this is um, we have not focused on the device at all. Uh, for us, Power Up is an enterprise system initiative where we're really fundamentally looking at what has to occur in our classrooms to really help improve, improve the, the environment and the learning occurring. For us, Power Up is really a three-legged milk stool. Uh, the first leg in that milk stool is, is technology. Uh, we are looking at technology to be the escalator. Um, we want it to be the facilitator to help learning occur in the classroom. The other thing that we, we see, the other leg in this is the hub. It's where all of our content, all of our curriculum, all of our digital resources are going to be stored. And the key with this is they're stored in HISD's ecosystem. So teachers don't have to go out to four different content providers to get their information. They go to a one-stop shop, they pick it up, and they get it. And the last leg of the, the milk stool is personalization or the instruction. What is occurring inside the classroom? So for us, Power Up really is that transformation initiative that's really moving us from the, the paper base to the digital environment. When you, you start thinking about making decision about going digital or trying to provide students with take-home devices to use at school at home, many people ask you the why you decided to do that. Uh, quite frankly, in, in Houston, it really stem from our desire to have a quality teacher in every classroom. And quite frankly, in spite of our best efforts, that was not happening. Uh, we would have schools in affluent parts of Houston that if we had a teacher vacancy, you literally would have 100 applicants. We had other schools in the inner city and the barrio where you might have a teacher vacancy and no one would apply. And in those schools, we often had our youngest, most inexperienced teachers teaching our most disadvantaged kids, um, kids who were coming from homes with little or no technology, not a lot of, of educational support. We believe that if we do this right, starting with our high schools, that we can help teachers become facilitators of learning uh, versus teachers who stand in front of the class professing knowledge I know a lot of people talk about moving teachers from being a professor of, uh, of knowledge to uh, a sage on the side or sage on the stage. Uh, we believe it goes much further than that. We believe if we do this correctly, our teachers are going to be teachers who facilitate learning with children. And by doing that, we really believe that we can improve the quality of, of instruction that, uh, and the learning that's going on in our classrooms. The, the interesting thing about these cornerstones is, um, you know, these aren't anything earth-shattering or, or a big surprise. They're um, cornerstones that most initiatives have. But I think the thing that Dr. Greer really made us think about is uh, leadership looks different when you're talking about transformation. There is a big difference between traditional leadership and transformational leadership. Um, there's a difference between traditional strategy and transformational strategy. And the, the piece about expectation management, you know, this, this is changing the, a very traditional culture that has existed for many years. So how do we create an environment, create expectations that take into account the culture change, but also move it in a way that people can accept? So these cornerstones are all about transformation and how you move a district. You know, when you start thinking about leadership, um, I, I can clearly tell everyone that the principal is absolutely the key. Uh, it's important that you have a superintendent, a chief technology information officer that has a vision, has the know-how uh, to help find the funding, to help with the infrastructure, to, to help people envision what can be. 
but where the rubber hits the roads is in the schoolhouse. And if you don't have principals that are 100% all in, this is not going to work, I'm telling you. And, and there may come a point where, as here in Houston, uh, you may have to consider having a different leader if the leader you have is not willing to get on board. One of the things that I, I think we did early on, again, another differentiator is um, we spent a lot of time talking about why we're doing this. Um, and I think that that's really important because too many times now when uh, we get called on, on our initiative, um, the very first thing that I ask people is why do you want to do it? And in most cases, their answer for why they want to do it is all about how they're going to do it, not the why. Um, and the why really starts to build understanding. And when Dr. Greer talks about you know, having principal buy-in, that buy-in can only occur when the principals understand at a very deep level why you're wanting to do this. And for us, the why is very simple. It's about our students. It's about preparing our students to live in the digital world. The how for us has been we're changing instruction. And you'll notice the how doesn't have anything to do with a device. For us, how we're doing it is changing instruction. The devices are allowing that to occur. And then we wanted to make sure that this is something that had a brand, that had an identity. Um, and so we spent a lot of time really going through and picking that stuff up. And, and making sure now when people go out and mention Power Up, they understand exactly what it looks like. When I talk about um, preparing our kids for the, the future, this is something that we have come up with um, that, that Dr. Greer really helped spearhead. It's creating that vision for our global graduate. Yeah, I think a lot of times in education we talk a lot about uh, preparing our students for the future, but we don't spend enough time really explaining and having deep internal conversation around what that ought to look like. And there's no question, at least here in Houston, we are s such a cosmopolitan city and such a diverse city that we knew getting our kids ready to work here in Houston, to go to college in Texas, to, to just look at what life might look like in a different part of America was not enough. Uh, literally, with the medical center here and the energy sector, this is a global city here in Houston. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, our graduates were global graduates, that they were college ready, that they could be leaders, they would be skilled as a communicator, be responsible decision makers, critical thinkers, and could be adaptive and productive. And around each one of those key uh, components, we've spent a good bit of time what that looks like and what that means and, and how, you could, how you could measure that. And so <clears throat> defining what a global graduate looks like and then executing a vision by putting in strategies um, to make that vision become real is really where we find ourselves right now. And so we're, we're looking at having to do things differently. Uh, when we start, about, start talking about digital transformation, uh, Lenny often says that it's really not about digital transformation at all. It's about system and district transformation. You, you have to transform how your curriculum department, your, your professional development, your communications, uh, every single component from how we budget our money to figuring out how to pay for this to how we recruit and hire teachers, every single major division had to go through a transformation in and of itself to support the one-on-one -on -one power up initiative that we have in place. Yeah, the, the thing when Dr. Greer talks about the strategy, again, I think that this is a, is a differentiator for um, comparing other systems out there. From the very beginning, uh, when I first started in the district and Dr. Greer talked to me about wanting to do uh, an initiative like Power Up, um, we both knew that this was not going to be a technology initiative, that in order for it to be successful, that people had to understand um, that it was a district initiative, a cross-functional uh, initiative that had to be aligned and everybody had to be clear on what they were going to do. And this, this group that you see on here, this is our cross-functional team. And these are members of that team that have been together since the, the second month we started this program. 
And what's, what's, I think, exceptional about this is everybody on this cross-functional team knows what our objective is, and they know what their role is in making that objective happen. So we'll spend just a few minutes kind of breaking down this group. Um, from a technology perspective, you know, our brick and mortar is making sure that our services are available, um, that the services kids need are available. So, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at our network and our wireless bandwidth, and, and that was one of the first conversations Dr. Greer and I had was, okay, what can our current network handle? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because um, Lenny's being very kind and, and is really not uh, telling everyone the key role he's played in all of this. When he first came to work here, when we recruited him uh, to come here from Katy ISD, uh, we were very clear our infrastructure was in an absolute mess. Uh, the district, when I arrived here in 2009, uh, had not received E-rate funding for over 12 years because of a, a previous E-rate improprieties that went, and scandal actually that, that occurred here. And it, it was really in, in pretty bad shape. And so we had to start, really start over. And so with some third partner help, uh, Lenny came in and built on some work that Arnie Viramontes had done, who was from Dallas, and came in. And we are finding ourselves now in a mud. But I couldn't begin to describe to you just uh, how far behind we, we were when Lenny came in here. And, and that all has to be taken into consideration when you think about scope and scale. Um, you know, and, and I'll tell you the thing that I have appreciated the most about coming to Houston is that there is an incredible sense of urgency for everything we do that's going to improve the students, improve the environment for the students. But you have to match that with what the capabilities are. Before I leave this slide, the one thing that I will tell you was the surprise um, that I think everybody needs to be very much aware of is network and wireless are givens. People, people focus on that. What tends to get overlooked is the filtering. Um, and for us, that has been the one of the main reasons when we see Internet slowness. It's because our filtering boxes are taxed. And the reason that is is that it, the environment that the teachers are using to go to the Internet is much more dynamic, and you need much more to be much more responsive. So take into account what you're doing from a filtering um, and make sure that you have the ability to be agile and flexible. Also, there's uh, a lot of districts around the country like the Houston Independent School District that are very decentralized. Uh, one of our challenges when Lenny and I first started working together on this project was how do we bring in <clears throat> to a central location, how do we re-centralize what had been heretofore such a decentralized approach where uh, we had schools all over Houston using every type of hardware you could possibly imagine. If there was a software product or an app that had been ever made anywhere in the world, it was being used here by someone. It was just the wild, wild west. Uh, it's, that principals did not want to give uh, up that degree of freedom and flexibility they had enjoyed. But we really did, I think, a, a good job communicating to our board that we had to centralize what we were doing because of security, because of scope, because of maintenance, and did really a good job um, outlining why we had to have a one approach, and that approach was power up, to move us from where we were to where we intend to be in, in three years. The other thing quickly is that uh, this poor infrastructure was probably a blessing because, quite frankly, um, I like to go fast. Kids only have one time in school. And I was pushing on Lenny pretty hard around, well, how many, how many schools can we do in year one? Can we do half in year one and half in year two? And, uh, of course, Lenny pushed back hard and said, look, whether we could or not, we just shouldn't. And we ended up going with 11 schools because in that first year, that was where we had the infrastructure in place to be able to support what we were doing. And so as we built that infrastructure out in year two, we, we were able to uh, basically go from a four-year to a three-year implementation plan because of Lenny and his team's good work. Um, but having a, a common device, having systems in place where you can involve teachers in reviewing apps, where you can involve teachers in helping you write and develop curriculum, and then, as Lenny said earlier, having a, a place, a hub, where you can park 
all of that curriculum is absolutely essential to what uh, we're trying to do. So Lenny's going to talk a little bit now about that hub and, and let you know a little more about why it's really a, a key, uh, one of those three legs he talked about to that milk stool. stool. That milk stool, stool, by the way, is a Wyoming thing. You know, they I got cows there. <laughs> I got to I got to bring Wyoming in whenever I can. All right. So so the hub and really it's our teaching and learning platform. It's um it's the convergence of curriculum management, learning management, um, all of these siloed strategies out there. What we were looking for is uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, a one stop shop. Uh, and, and what we're looking for, um, and we selected the product, It's Learning, um, as, our, as our foundation for the hub. Uh, this is where we are converting all of our content, um, all of our textbooks. Uh, Dr. Greer made it very clear to everybody that we would no longer purchase textbooks at the high school level. Um, and, and so what we've done is we've, we've now looked at how do we get that content digitally stored in our, in our learning object repository in the hub. It's where teachers are going to create lesson plans. It's where uh, the content is either going to be procured, it's going to be curated, or it's going to be created. And our preference, uh, and Dr. Greer has also made this very clear, is that we, we focus on how do we create the content. And that is student-created content and teacher-created content. Um, so the hub really has been the, one of the key transformations. And again, the, the critical part of this is that teachers are not having to go out to multiple ecosystems. They're going to our hub. We're also very, uh, very far into uh, the interoperability based on IMS global standards. So the content that can be provided to us at the LTI or the common cartridge layer, we are really uh, taking advantage of that. And we're also making it a standard. So they might not be able to, to provide it to us in LTI or common cartridge today. But what we are telling providers is in the very near future, and we want to know what that very near future is, you will have to provide it to us with LTI or common cartridge, or you will not do business with the district. Um, the last piece of this is training. So, you know, we focus a lot of, on of attention on training teachers, but I will tell you that is not the only audience you have to spend time training what this change of instruction looks like. We, we spend a lot of time focused uh, training on our professional development team. We trained our curriculum team. Um, and we're having to train our students because as adept that they are at using technology, going in and getting their homework and getting their resources online, this is very foreign to them. And so we spent a lot of time on what our training strategies are. So the hub is our one-stop shop for everything. The last strategy is, is professional development. Lenny touched on it a little. Uh, we have struggled somewhat in trying to convince our, or to explain to our teachers uh, what instruction will look like now using one-to-one uh, -one laptops. And, you know, integrating the tools of instruction, it's kind of interesting. And we've worked a lot with the Morrisville Independent School District. They've done a lot of our training here for our teachers. Uh, fascinatingly enough, they, they'll come in, spend a week, uh, give me feedback, let me feedback about how we're one or two years ahead of they, where they were when they started five or six years ago. And yet, then I would spend time talking with some principals and teachers, and they would say, "Wait a minute, we don't, we're not sure we're quite where they say we are." And it's like most other things: you have early adopters, and then you have those that know how, no way, no day. And so, what we find ourselves in the midst of is fighting for the souls and minds of those tweeners, the those in between the early adopters and and those naysayers. And we know, and we're fully aware, as Morris Wallace told us, that there will come a day when everyone has to get on, on board because this ship has sailed and we're not going back. And we're not saying that in a mean-spirited, unprofessional way, but that's just the reality of the day in the Houston Independent School District. We've also worked very closely with the mobile technology lab uh, in the University of San Diego. And so in addition to Mark Edwards and his team from Mooresville, Scott Himmelstein and his folks have really done a fantastic job coming in and helping us uh, develop content and hold focus group meetings with teachers. Uh, we've worked with this learning. We've worked with discovery. So our third party uh, partnerships have really been critical to the work that we're doing here. 
we also, uh, not surprising to us, we, we, we just have been so pleased with the way our students have stepped up. In many of our classes, our teachers will have a, a quote, student helper that when things go awry from a technology perspective, that kid can step in and all of a sudden right the ship without making the teacher uh, look bad. And it's gone really, really well. And in addition, we have in each one of our high schools, we have required that each principal designate full-time two staff members, one to be in charge of basically a technology repair and the other to be in charge of, of curriculum and, and how to teach model lessons in the school. And so in, in the Technology Repair Center, many of those folks have, have put teams of students together and are training them and are doing minor repairs to our, our, our laptops. Uh, we have a critical issue, of course, they send it to Lenny and his folks either repair it or they send it back to um, HP and they, they send us a new one. So this professional development piece is, I think, something that we've come to, to understand is, again, one of those key uh, cornerstones of this program. It never stops and it never ends. And we have been allowing schools to have half-day uh, early dismissals each month to focus on training that their teachers, their administrators, kids and parents actually need to, to make power up run. And so the hard part is in a big high school where you may have 100 teachers. Uh, you think, well, gosh, we've got all the training done, phase one training done, but what then you all of a sudden realize is you may have 10 new teachers or you may have 20 new teachers. And so phase one never ends. Phase one is a cycle that, that, is, that continuously spins. And then you have phase two. And then you have phase three. You, you, you constantly have people moving through the different um, training cycles that we have. Uh, and, and everyone has to understand if you're going to go down this road, uh, you're not going to finish with this. This has to be part of your budget. It has to be part of your priorities. Absolutely. The, uh, just a couple things that I would add on to what Dr. Greer was talking about. The third party support, um, it is, it's invaluable. Uh, for any school system out there to bring in people that can have a different uh, set of eyes look at this. But it also can be viewed very threatening by your internal team. And so I, I, early on we had a lot of apprehension about using these external groups because people were viewing it as the, the district didn't think we could do our job. So yeah, I think you have to be mindful of setting the tone up for that. And so you know, once we got over that hurdle and people recognized they're here to make us better, it, it changed the, the whole environment. The other thing I will tell you is the maturity matrix. We have adopted the TIM model. There's also the SAMR model out there. But having a maturity matrix that principals and professional development and teachers can use to understand where they're at and what they need to do to progress is so important. It takes ambiguity and it takes individual perception out of the mix. And that's what we were starting to get. We would have five people go observe uh, teachers and we would get five different opinions. And it was confusing for a principal and it was very confusing for the teacher. Once we adopted the TIM model, everybody worked from the same play sheet. And I think that that really cleared everything up. The last thing that we'll, we'll talk about is expectation management. And, and I think this has been um, something that has been a major game changer in HISD uh, from just the overall perception. Teachers have not viewed this initiative as threatened, threatening or principals have not viewed this as threatening. And I think it's because the tone was set with Dr. Greer from the very beginning. Um, you know, we have said this is, this is going to be a three-year initiative, and Dr. Greer mentioned it earlier. You know, at some point you need to go, but we are going to give you all the time that you need in that three years, and we're going to give you all the resources you need to come to terms with what this looks like. Um, the expectation management was, I think, also very important between Dr. Greer and myself, right? Um, I understand that his sense of urgency, he wants to get things done, but he's also counting on me to make sure whatever we do, we do it right. And that's the one thing that I will give Dr. Greer absolute credit for is he will push us as hard as, as we possibly can, but he wants it done right. Um, and I think that his cabinet has to have that ability to 
uh, understand that, that desire to do things quickly, but then it's also our responsibility to say, here's how we can get it done as quickly as possible, ensuring that it's done right. Yeah, and to really add on to that a little bit uh, to, with us, uh, we, we really have been very patient and we have partnered up the reluctant teachers with the early adopters. Uh, we have, particularly in training our principals, uh, we have many times partnered them up with deans or assistant principals that really feel very comfortable about technology. And so we have been, we will continue to be patient. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, we, we do know there come a day where everyone has to be all in. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's, we think we're going about this right. I couldn't be more proud of Lenny and his team and all of Team HISD for the way that, that we have, have progressed with this very, very, very important initiative. And, and the, um, the embracing the varying degrees of adoption, this goes directly back to what Dr. Greer started our conversation with and, and saying the key is the principle. When you have the principal that's engaged, you have a campus that is engaged. When you have a principal who delegates this transformation leadership to an assistant principal or to a dean of instruction, you see a completely different level of engagement. So you just need to have an appreciation for that. So I think that is the end of our, our talk, and I will turn it back to the Ed Week team. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation, and I'm very eager to get into a discussion, and there's lots of great questions for you. Um, before we do that, I want to just take a minute to hear from our sponsor, It's Learning. So hello, I'm Bailey Mitchell, and I'm the Chief Academic Officer with It's Learning US. Uh, it's Learning is a leading international provider of a pedagogy-focused cloud-based learning management system. We have offices in Boston, Atlanta, and eight offices across the world with our global headquarters based in Bergen, Norway, and Boston. We have over five, four and a half million students worldwide in the platform, and we're focused only on K-12 with our largest partner being Houston ISD. Houston ISD branded the its learning platform the Power Up Hub as the center of collaboration, personalization, curriculum, instruction, and communication for all HISD staff, students, and parents. The It's Learning platform and services offering is a story of 14 years experience. We have over 220 employees and 50% of those employees have a background in education. 25% of our resources are put back into design and development of the its learning platform. And our normal adoption rate after the first year is 80%. We as a company are focused only on K-12 in the U.S. And just, you know, appreciate being able to be part of this. And uh, thank you for uh, a few minutes to speak about its learning. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So now I'd like to get into a bit of discussion with Lenny and Terry. And I want to start by talking about something that you guys mentioned, sort of this big picture versus reality and how you balance each other out. I know you mentioned that initially, Terry, you wanted to start with more schools and sort of a bigger process. And Lenny had to say, you know, if we're going to do this right, we've got to scale back a little bit and take it a little bit slower. Have there been other instances like that as this have, has evolved? And, and also, how do you create the type of relationship between the two of you where Lenny feels comfortable saying to his boss, the superintendent, you know, you think you can do that, but you can't? I'll be frank with you, you can't have an effective organization, whether you're a big school district, a small district, or whether you're running a restaurant. If, if you don't have an environment where uh, your key employees can, can talk to your CEO in a very direct manner, you're not going to be very effective. And I've, I've known that my entire career. And I also think that when you, you hire people, you have to screen for a willingness for people to, to, to stand up and push back and to feel 
very, very comfortable in their own skin. And I know when uh, we first were recruiting uh, Lenny, and it was funny, Bailey's here today, and he, he, he might, want to talk, might not want me to tell you the story, but I actually called Bailey. He was a, a chief technology officer in Georgia and had a fantastic national reputation. And Bailey said, well, you know, why are you calling me? You have Lenny Shad right next door to you. And, and uh, of course, when we called Lenny and he came in, one of the things that immediately impressed me was Lenny, Lenny's willingness to take a stand and to speak his mind. And if you if you you're a CEO in any organization and you don't recruit for that uh, really skill set in in your your key leaders, you're you're missing the boat. And so that's why I would expect everyone to be able to do that. And most of the time, it's um we do that every day. Whether it's uh, what kind of machine you're going to use, to what kind of curriculum, to training schedules, to early release days, and it's always that push and pull, that yin and yang, which I think make, has made this very, very effective. And this is not just with Lenny, it's with our curriculum department, it's with our, our finance department, it's with our human resources department. Every, everyone on this team has, a, has a, a willingness and a green light to push back. Yeah, and I would say that that last part that Dr. Greer talked about, I think that, that <clears throat> that's key, is that um, he creates the environment where he wants to push the envelope, he wants to throw new ideas out, but he is, his expectation is that he has a leadership team in place that will balance uh, his desire to do something with that reality of how can we get it done as quick as possible, but more importantly done right. It's interesting, and I agree with Dr. Greer completely. You know, if you're going to be an effective leader, I think your primary role is to push your team. And if you uh, don't have a group of individuals who are willing to push back on you, um, you as a leader are going to be less, less willing to take risks and try new ideas because it's all going to fall back on you. And so your scope of responsibility of what you're really going to have to know broadens. And I think your tendency is, again, to draw down to very – uh, maintenance mode and not do anything new. Um, I manage almost identical to Dr. Greer with my team. Uh, you know, I am pushing them all the time and my expectation is you're going to come back and tell me you can do it or you're going to tell me here's how we can do it but it looks a little bit differently. But it's created by the leader. Um, it's consistency in the style so, you know, we don't have to wonder can we talk to Dr. Greer about this or no, we can't talk to Dr. Greer about that. He builds that culture and, and honestly he puts that expectation up from the very beginning and you will either adhere to his expectations and his style or you're not going to be successful here and that's the way it should be as a leader. Yeah, and oftentimes when I'll, I'll ask the team, well, we really need to do this and can we do this to the scope? Because when, when you have 283 schools, scope is the key. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's just that's one of the reasons I think a lot of the big major urbans are, are really struggling with the digital transformation. Uh, you can't eat that elephant all at once. But when I push and say, well, can we do this? You know, staff will say, yes, we can do that. But here's, what it would, here's, here's the kind of resources it would take for us to do that. Well, then we quickly realize, well, <laughs> we don't have those resources, so okay, uh, let's get it right the first time. Uh, we're going to make enough mistakes, but if, if we're going to do this, let's get it right. If we, we can't get it to the scope that we want, let's get it right. And, and that means you're going to get it right in cycle one, then you've got to get it right in cycle two, and then you must get it right in cycle three. And as I said, that cycle continues to spins, and then we have to get it right all the time. Well, and just also talk a little bit, uh, you kind of touched on this during your presentation. Um, there, it, there seems like there's a real importance in developing trust, not, between, not just between the two of you and the leadership team, but a trust amongst all the educators and all the teachers and all the principals in your schools that what you're doing has been thought through and is in the best interests of the students and the educators. You mentioned, you know, um, outside groups coming in and evaluating and you know that can be seen as something that's very scary um, if you don't trust that the leadership has your best interests in mind you could worry that it would be you know punitive how did you develop that that atmosphere and that trust throughout the district not just at um, the high-level district 
Well, I think the fir very first thing, again, it has to do with screening and hiring people who have shared values and beliefs. Because if, if you really believe all children can learn, no buts, and you, you really believe in the worth of teachers and principals and support staff, we talk a lot about Team HISD here, and we really believe that. It's not just something that we say. Everyone is important. And then you got to do what you say you'll do. Uh, and if, if you decide that you can't do it, you, you need to go back and explain why not. And, uh, and, and you, you need to also admit when you've made mistakes. And you need to say, I'm sorry sometimes. Um, so I, I think it's, again, training is a big, big piece of this. Uh, we have also learned that while we really could never, ever uh, explain or underestimate the power of third parties to do training like Mooresville and Discovery and University of San Diego. Our teachers like to be trained by their peers. And so where Lenny has done, I think, just a stellar job is uh, working with our curriculum department and our staff development department to identify those early adopters who are also good trainers. And so we ha we're doing a lot of the training in cycle two with our own people. Being supported, yes, by, by the folks from Mooresville, North Carolina, and the University of San Diego, Discovery, It's Learning, and others. But our teachers, it builds trust when our teachers can see model classrooms, model power up teaching. Uh, we also have done uh, a lot of work with uh, New Tech High School in Maynard, Texas, which has one of the best project-based uh, learning approaches that we've run across. And they've done a lot of training for us. And so it's, it's just a combination of, of treating people well and, and respecting others, I think. It, it, for me, it's, it's been the consistency of this initiative. Um, when you talk to the principals and the teachers, um, you know, they make comments about how this has been one of the, the most um, well-aligned, comprehensive, everybody on the same page project since they've been in the district. And we've been consistent where we have said, here are our expectations. We have not deviated from those expectations. And I think too often people go in with realistic expectations, but three months in, those expectations change, and I think that's where you start to get crossways with principals and teachers. Um, the school board, Dr. Greer, all of that from the top down, we have remained very consistent with our year in and year out expectations, and I think that has been one of the biggest drivers in getting people to stay on board and understand, you know what, we can make mistakes. We can go at our own pace, which is so important. Now, I mean, you mentioned that early on when Lenny arrived there that uh, technology was in somewhat of a shambles and people were using all types of software, all types of devices. So getting everyone on the same page, um, getting rid of textbooks for high school, I mean, really pushing this digital model is a huge culture change. How did you balance, and, and you talked about also um, having to sort of get the in-betweens, not the, the people who are on board right away and not the people who are really against it. I mean, how did you balance sort of this, this urgency um, to move forward with getting people to buy into it and including people in the process so that, you know, a lot of people feel like they have a say and have impact on where this is going? Yeah, we used a, we we really did use a lot of, of, of project teams uh, made up of teachers and principals, and we involved an awful lot of people. It took more time. It took a lot of hard work, but uh, involving people early on so that they are um, so they buy into the process and they're part of the process, I think is is extremely important and it's it's a huge key. I'm going to keep coming back. Lenny will too. Uh, we can't understate the importance of the principal. Uh, and so a lot of our early training was principal training. And we would actually train principals before we would train teachers. And so we would train principals. The early adopters among our principals, and some of them are quite good, would then come back and actually help lead the training as we train teachers. And when you do it in a non-threatening way, for example, we gave the computers out to the teachers in cycle one, and we still do it in the summer. Uh, we spend the entire summer and all of first semester with training. 
the kids didn't actually get their devices until January. So we wanted to make sure that we did our part for, for the teachers participating in the program to feel comfortable. Um, we decided to put the support in place, as you heard, heard me talk about earlier, where each school has a almost a dean of technology, if you will, or a teacher development specialist that deals with, with the use of technology in the teaching and learning um, atmosphere. We had a student in each, at least one student in each teacher's classroom uh, that was really, really, really uh, technology savvy. So we tried to give the support uh, that teachers need. And we, we don't have it all right. We, we'll tell you right now, we don't. Uh, we still struggle some. But I tell you, we're, we're doing more, we have more success stories than we have struggle stories. Yeah, you know, I, I think it goes back to you, you come up with your strategy, you put systems, structures, and processes in place to support that strategy, and then you deal with the issues when they come up. And again, it's that consistency in, in adhering to that strategy. So as I look back on the last two years, you know, I don't think that we have fundamentally taken a step back and said, okay, we need to blow this, this thing up. What we have done is taken minor tweaks to it. But what I, I, what I will tell you is every step of this process has involved principals, it's involved teachers, um, it's involved the central office staff. So I think, you know, again, as long as you stay true to the fact that this is a district initiative made up of a lot of different departments, and those departments are the ones that have to come together to solve for a problem. Um, your resolution time goes down, and your ability to quickly identify what the issue is and keep the project moving forward um, is, is there because of that cross-functionality. So I would say it goes back to that, that core structure that, that Dr. Greer created when we first came here, and just staying true to that and knowing that the teams you have put together they are the ones that will solve the problem. Let them solve the problem and move forward. That's great. Can, can I ask you about, um, you mentioned the TIM model, which sort of allowed you to uh, determine where you were in this process. But when you think about success, what you define as success, um, how have you sort of thought about this goal? Because it, it may not just be about our kids doing better on assessments. What is success to you with this? with this process? So to, to me, uh, success is when uh, we feel much, much more comfortable that we have uh, quality teaching and learning going on in every classroom. And to me, that's the defining yardstick. That's the end all of tape measures. Uh, once we can use this powerful tool to make sure that we steadily in increase the impact that uh, the teaching and learning that's going on in every school in Houston, uh, that's how we will, will measure success. Like you said, the test scores, the attendance, the uh, school student behavior, office referrals, uh, that's going to all take care of itself if we have more engaged kids um, and we make sure that the education opportunities are relevant to the to real world and that it all fits together uh, there's no question in my mind that we did that that's the yardstick that we need to be using. Great. Yeah, you know, I, and, and it's funny, we just had this conversation a week ago in our cabinet meeting. Um, you know, we, we look at what that fourth year of this initiative is going to be, and so those campuses that are going into that fourth year, we want it to be part of their culture, right? We want great tier one instruction occurring in every classroom, and we want to be able to see how technology is that accelerator in making that happen. But it all goes back to exactly what Dr. Greer just said. It's tier one instruction occurring in every single classroom. And the degree that we're using our hub and we're using technology to escalate that, that's great. But it's tier one instruction. Great. I want to get quickly to some questions. We have a lot of engaged participants here who have lots of questions for you. I think the one that you know many districts would want to know is uh, one we have here from Christopher Nordstrom. How did you pay for this? That's what people want to know. 
<laughs> we we sold candy and donuts and had a few fundraisers. <laughs> uh, no, I'll be frank with you. Uh, we we made decisions about um, uh, leasing the equipment versus purchasing. Uh, when I was superintendent in San Diego, California, prior to coming to here, we had a huge, huge digital conversion project there. And I thought we made a mistake by deciding to buy the, the laptops or the netbooks that we used there because, quite frankly, in three to four years, they're, they're worn out and you've got to replace them. And so we basically uh, redirected funds. Uh, the money that we don't spend to purchase textbooks, the money we don't spend on supplies and materials, uh, we looked in the district and saw programs that we did not think were effective. Uh, how we are spend, spending money on uh, software, uh, we, we just basically did a deep dive scrub of our budget uh, to come up with, uh, with, with how to, to pay for the program. Uh, we're using a lot of Title I, mo uh, excuse me, Title II money for staff development. That's federal dollars. Um, but that's how, that's how we did it. So if you go back to the first part of this presentation, and we talked about um, the cornerstones and, and that they were cornerstones around transformation. Um, when you think about transformation, at the core is you are abandoning something. You are fundamentally changing what you're doing. So the only way you can really think about this project is what are we going to stop doing? Because if this is now the wagon that we are going to hitch ourselves to, that means that we should stop. And I tell you, when you talk to districts that are struggling, this is an area that they did not take into account. They had this added on, or this is an addition to what the teachers were already expected to do, and it just doesn't make sense. By having this approach to say, look, what are we going to stop doing, we were able, as Dr. Greer said, we found the funds internally, which it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to watch happen. And Terry said it plenty of times before, for every dollar we spend, there's an advocate, right? And so there were a lot of hard conversations about, you know what, we're not going to do this. We're not spending money on this anymore. And I think that's, that's the, the key. It, it is hard conversations. It, it really is. But uh, we're not a wealthy school district. <coughs> we just, we really aren't. And in most places I know there are, there's money to do this. Uh, it takes a, a vision. I know when we went to our board to talk about doing this, uh, we took board members with us on bench, uh, what we call benchmarking trips around the country to see what other people were doing well and what they were not doing so well. And we had a plan. We had a finance plan that we presented to the board. We said, here's how we can pay for this. Uh, other thing, I eliminated a significant number of central office positions and redirected those salary savings into, um, into this program to pay for the lease of this, uh, this hardware. Well, I know you said earlier that this program is not about the devices, but obviously the students have devices and the, the teachers have devices. So what did you think about when you were considering different devices, and what devices did you ultimately choose? So I'll be frank with you. We, we, I was very interested in Apple. <clears throat> I've always been kind of a Mac person. I've got a Mac at home, and you know, Morris will use Macs. And as we went around the country, uh, we, we liked it because it was a solid-state solid machine. It was hardy. If you dropped it, it didn't always, uh, you know, the in, internal components didn't fall apart. And uh, we really looked hard at Apple, quite frankly. I thought they were arrogant. Uh, they basically said, here's, uh, here's what the machine cost, and this is that they weren't willing to, to lease the machines to us any uh, less expensive. If, you know, we're, we're doing about 10,000 per, per grade level, so we're doing about 40, 45,000 machines in our high schools, but we got no cut on price. And so we basically we went back and, and looked at the, the particular Apple machine, and we decided, well, here, here are the specs. Let's use these specs and spec this out and see what else we can find in the marketplace. And, and we, we did a call for proposal, and we ended up with a very good uh, HP machine. You know, the other thing that we did is this was the big tablet versus laptop debate, right? right. And, um, you know, when Terry talks about going out and doing these site visits, we spent a lot of time talking to the kids and the teachers. And um, when we came back, it was so clear to us, particularly at the high school level, Having that form factor with an attached keyboard, something that was durable, it was just a non-negotiable for us. So the, the tablets we quickly ruled out. We wanted a laptop device that the kids could 
to do some, you know, some in-depth work on, and so it was a matter then of just picking what laptop. And, and honestly, you know, we, we let the kids look at it, we let the teachers yep. have a lot of input into this. Um, we were not going to get caught into the hardware debate, right? It's, it's, it's a worthless debate to get caught into. We just wanted something that was cost effective, that we could lease, and it was going to be durable, and we're very happy with the device we have now. And then real quick, we, we, just, we had to make a key decision that once we implemented these devices in these high schools, uh, we had to recapture other devices that they had and we brought them back inside and uh, Lenny and his team scrubbed them and looked at the ones that we thought we could continue to use and then we shuttled the ones we couldn't and then we redistributed those machines to the seventh and eighth grade in many of our middle schools and now once we get this program in place in all of our high schools we have already started right now looking at what other programs could we discontinue, what other funding could we find to, to move this down to 8th grade, then 7th grade, then 6th grade, etc. And uh, we, by not purchasing these high school textbooks, that will be one stream of revenue. When you couple that with then not purchasing uh, middle school textbooks, uh, we think we can come pretty close. We're also a, a, a Title I district. We're a district-wide Title I school system. And so they're, they're also, we're looking at whether or not we can use some federal funds uh, to provide, uh, to offset some of the cost of, of the lease. That's great. Now, I'm going to ask, uh, we have several questions about the hub, um, and we just have a short time left. So I want to just ask all these together. Um, people want to know if the hub is just for secondary schools, or is it for all schools? Is it accessible beyond the internet of the district, or and if parents can access it? Yeah, so the, the hub we are getting ready to go live with at every one of our schools beginning next year. We were piloting it this year at 29 schools, K through 12. Um, so the hub will be something utilized by everybody. It is um, an Internet-based solution, so um, our kids can get access to it anytime, anywhere, uh, which was, is something that we're very excited about. And parents can have access to it. We're figuring out the timing of when we're going to actually make that happen. Um, you know, obviously we want to give our kids time to get used to it, we want to give our teachers time to get used to it, and then open it up to our parents. That's great. Okay, well I think we've just run out of time for questions when we had some fantastic questions from our, our participants here. And we've got a quick message from our sponsor, It's Learning, and then we'll finish up. So why It's Learning? I think at the core of our um, offering, districts were able to have a, a place where all digital content and assessments can be uh, housed on behalf of teachers, students, and staff, all in one place, basically a one-stop shop. We have a customizable planner with curriculum templates at, that are aligned to standards as our centerpiece. We have a robust library and a recommendation engine that enables a teacher to better be able to differentiate as, they, as students progress against standards. And I think key uh, and, and a key value, a key belief system at its learning is that student ownership of learning is essential uh, to enabling personalization. Uh, through its learning, students can create in the platform, not just consume. We're a solid, uh, mature company that, again, is just focused solely on K-12. Houston's The Hub is uh, a great example of where we have been able to work collaboratively to realize uh, the ability to, to as, as you heard Dr. Greer talk and, and, and Lenny, to realize some of the efficiencies of bringing things together in a single place and uh, you know, ultimately saving some money and being able to redirect that spend towards things like uh, student laptops and uh, a learning platform. We're fortunate that we have a uh, robust uh, mobile application and it enables students to always know uh, what they have to do and when. And I think uh, just as a, a, a summary, you know, why it's learning. Uh, 
we have a culture that values face-to-face, -face, and we're driven by relationships. Uh, our partnership with HISD uh, is, is one that uh, we value in a significant way. We're on site with the district working uh, hand in glove uh, on things like our uh, integration into our library, those open educational resources and publisher resources that were uh, talked about during this webinar. We respect and align to our district's visions and their goals, and we're absolutely dedicated to the success of a partner like HISD. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to remind everyone that if you'd like to watch today's presentation again, an on-demand archive will be made available through edweek.org within the next 24 hours. And you can visit edweek.org to find articles that explore today's topic and others in the EdTech field. But you can also visit edweek.org backslash leaders to read the Leaders to Learn From story about EdTech leadership and innovation in Houston as well as articles that highlight innovative leaders in all areas of education. I want to thank our two guests for a fantastic presentation, for sharing all that they've learned with us. And I want to thank the audience for participating and submitting such great questions. Hope you all have a wonderful afternoon.